What was the date where you first met Eve personally, Tony? Well, I first met his work in a bookshop in 1959, and it was the one of those uh, eureka moments. And I wrote to him, and he uh, very flatteringly praised my early translations and said, would I like to come and see him, and would I send him my own poems? And I hadn't written any yet. So really, everything began with the book bookshop encounter with Bonfoy. I met him first in 1964, and... Um, well, I'll come on to the other question about which were the, um, the uh, what about, uh, you know, uh, it w which particular books uh, hit me and would still hit me. But that, that's how I first met him. And uh, as, as you may know, or perhaps we should put this on record, that uh, volume one was the poetry a few years ago, which included poetic prose, and volume two which we're talking here to talk about today, are a selection of Eve's um, uh, critical essays in several domains, uh, uh, edited by the three of us, led, led by Stephen. So um, that's my kickoff. John. I, I first met Yves Bonfoy in 1978 when he came to the University of California at Santa Cruz where I was teaching. Um, he didn't drive a car. And so he very, very uh, willingly accepted my proposition that I drive him around. And I must say, I, we just became very good friends. I'll never forget a long drive along Highway One from Santa Cruz up towards San Francisco. And on that drive, you have a magnificent, you have the ocean, the Pacific Ocean on your left, and then you have the, the, the meadows and the hills, the fields. And I asked Eve, which do you prefer? You know, the sea or the, the earth? And without a second's pause, he said the earth. And in all the work I've done on him over all these years, I've come to understand how deeply important the that notion of la terre the, the earth is to eve how central it is in his work l'arrière pays well now l'arrière pays is another matter because in the, the stephen could talk could speak about this yes well there, it's my turn um i didn't meet well i i'm i was a relative latecomer i went to france in 1981 after a year in the state, actually. And I was living in Montmartre. And um, one day a friend of mine gave me the arrière-pays, l'arrière-pays. Um, and I was completely bowled over by its mixture of autobiography, high culture, metaphysical urgency, landscape, la terre. And I wanted to translate it. And then it turned out that Eve was my next door neighbor, literally, in the Rue Le Pique. I did not know that. So I wanted to meet him, so I sent him a poem um, saying, can I use this quote of yours as an epigraph? Which I thought was a cunning way of uh, getting to meet him. But he then said, yes, of course you can, mais il est parfois agréable de ne pas connaître ses voisins. It is sometimes convenient not to know your neighbors. <laughs> so I didn't actually meet him properly till I think he invited me formally to the Collège de France when I was um, translating the RERP and I had questions for him. So that was our first official meeting at the Collège. And I think he, has, he acceded to the chair in 1981, is that right? In the Collège, I think so. Voila, that's my, that's my entrée. <laughs> what? You asked um, what if one had a favorite piece in the collection which is a difficult question to answer when you've lived with a book like mm. this for years and with the work for even longer. But if I, if I have to answer that, say, I think mine would be the Rambo, uh, partly, and that's because the three key books for me by Bonfort were all published around the late 50s, early 60s. L'Improbable, a collection of the first Improbable, collection of essays, art, literature, very Bonfoy-esque, very poetic. Then the little book on, the first book on Rambo, 
and the, the second main book of poetry, uh, Hier Réunion Désert. And those are my sort of touchstones. Those are the ones I always return to. And, um, and, and the Ian Banforth, well, that we can't name all the translators in this book. There's about 10, I would say. No one person could, could have done it, I don't think. 16 translators, Tony. How many? 16. I 16, know. as many as 16. Gosh, yes, yes. So even, even, even more. So that's... Have you, John, have you got a preference? Well, I was just going to say, it's, it's normal, I suppose, to have a preference for the works that you lived with so intimate, so with such intimacy while translating them. And in my case, I translated the Bunfois book of poetry called Ce qui fut sans lumière. Uh, the English translation was published by the University of Chicago Press in 1991. It's a book I remain uh, very loyal to and very fond of. I also translated Dans le Leur du Seuil, a book of Bonfois published in 1975. I think I only translated, four, it's in seven parts, I think I only translated four or five and they were translated in Temenos, which was a review that was edited by the late Kathleen Rain. But uh, I'm very fond of a book called Pierre Ecrit, 1965. Uh, that's when you sense a sort of change in Bonfoy. Uh, he's, 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 he's very happy. He's uh, met uh, his wife, Lucy Vines, a wife of what was going to be that relationship is going to be a relationship of 50 years. Uh, and they found a place in the South of France to which they became very devoted. And it's the, it's the scene of much of Bonfoy's writing from 19, poetic writing from 1965 forward, deep attachment. Um, but of the prose essays that we're commenting on today, um, I have a, a very uh, I have a very, um, not so much a preference, I have a, a deep attachment to an essay called Readiness, Ripeness, Hamlet, Lear. I think it's one of the best of his es many, many essays on Shakespeare. He's written a dozen essays on Shakespeare and has translated all of the major, uh, all the tragedies and even some of the works that are a bit hard to characterize, like The Tempest and um, as you like it. Uh, but Readiness, Ripeness, Hamlet, Lear, it, I think summarizes some of his most principal, some of his most consistent, um, consistently articulated principles and values in a, in a relatively short scope. I don't think it's more than 20 pages or so. Uh, so I, those are some of the things I'm very fond of, but I, I, like Tony and Stephen, uh, I'm one of those who have read virtually everything Bunfo has written. And so it's hard to pick out any one thing in a way. Stephen, I bet I can anticipate what he might say. Yes. Well, <laughs> yes, except that um, we're talking about the prose book. Um, yes, as I say, my first encounter was the AVRP, which was a long periplus that took me ages to translate and wasn't published till 2012. So it was a process of about 20 years of my life, partly because it, um, there was a copyright problem with the uh, former publisher, the Swiss publisher, Skira. And so the book is very, very precious to me and um, sort of is part of me. But in the actual selection in the prose book, part two of the reader we're talking about, I. I love actually the, the opening essay, Byzantium, Byzance, because it takes up some of the exciting, Bonfo has a very, very, um, what I say, kind of, um, he can invest a metaphysical excitement into the idea of a boat leaving port, um, stopping at a crossroads, that's the Ariape, the famous anxiety. These moments of anxiety. Um, and Byzantium, translated by John beautifully, I have to say, um, uh, deals with high theology, um, 
and he and he takes issue with Yeats as well. There's a great dialogue with with Yeats. Um, but one for always, as in the Tombeau de Ravenne, which is another great essay, taking the side of the mortal finitude. It's another it's another word we have to um, conjure with today. Uh, everything that is of this earth and that is not, therefore, supernatural. I think we can say. And that parti pris, which is very important. Find, you find in the other, other my other favorite essays on art, that are the ones on Bernini, the angel on top of the baldequin, whose foot is caught, as it were, in the earth, even as the angel is swept up towards heaven. Um, and on Poussin, Poussin is the great favorite of of, of Eve's. Um, and in, in this essay, again, uh, he takes issue with, uh, he places Poussin as a Neoplatonist against Christian censorship of the flesh, for example, at the same time saying he can talk to his Christian contemporaries. It's a very interesting essay. Anyway, yeah, um, and the one on Malachme, great essay on Malachme. Uh, again, another. Uh, crucial, it's just before the Rambo essay that, that Tony loves, but the one on Malamé, I think you have to take those figures almost together always. He, but it, it's uh, an agon, it's against Malamé. It's an it's agon, not, yes, yes. For Rambo. Interesting. It is, except there's always a, a sort of rueful affection for Malamé. It's a, it, I think I've called it once, it's a love embrace, it's a war embrace, rather. It's a war <laughs> embrace. It's the frère ennemi. Yeah, for reasons for reasons we can maybe go into or not. Anyway, I choose. I, I have to say, in general, I have come very much towards the writings on art in the prose book. But they are they probably. I think they're my favourites actually now, to be honest. Um, it's hard to think of a, another poet uh, with this rain with this parallel oeuvre of prose. And, which is not journalism, book review, nothing wrong with that, but it's not book reviews or newspaper articles. It, these are major essays, or some of them even like small small books in, in such a range of field, such a range of um, domains, and but always, always concerned with yet yeah, finitude and presence, to introduce uh, one of the key terms that we haven't yet used. Yes. Finitude and presence, and his battle, his battle against the concept, his war against conceptual thinking, paradoxically by deploying the greatest skills as a conceptual thinker. Yes, well, that's another problem. <laughs> that's another problem, and including for the translator, because French yes. thinks these things differently from English. Well, the earliest book of po poems, I believe, is called Anti Anti Platon. So in a, a very short cut way of talking about concept and presence is to say yes. he's, against, he's against the notion of platonic forms, higher forms, concentration of conceptual form, because it cuts out the warts and all of existing here and now. I don't know if John would agree with that. Um, the existence of... And I think Valsant, John, do you want to comment on Valsant? As, as, because you've done the great poem on, on how important Valsant is in Provence. Well, if, what's, um, the, what's interesting here is that Stephen very recently visited uh, Bonnefort and his wife Lucie found a place in southern France near the Vacher Mountain. Uh, um, called Valsant, uh, the place is in Valsant, which, which was a, seems to have been a, a monastery of some sort. Um, and he was immediately drawn to this place um, with the proximity of the almond trees and the, uh, the, wa the flow of the water. His poetry is, is full of an evocation of this place. Uh, and 
it's not, he sold it some years before his death and it was acquired by someone now, I believe, Stephen, you'll come in on this, who uh, is in some sort of flower business. He sells, he, he sells flowers from this building, which once had a, had a chapel uh, and Bunfa lived in this, he tried to convert this into a place to be lived in, in the, uh, at a contemporary moment, while still being deeply moved by the vestiges of a sacred order, is somewhat in ruins, the stones yeah. falling and in need of repair. And in some sense, that place became emblematic of his own project, which, as he said in a book about Rambo, he said, the truly modern act is to try to create the divine life without God. Uh, we, if we had time, we could talk about of his very uh, complex uh, relation to transcendence. Um, he once said in an essay on, I think it was on Mugliano, uh, uh, Mogliani, is it? Mogliani. Momigliano. Mogliano, thank you. Um, Momigliano. Momigliano. Perdonate me. Uh, and he says, uh, in that essay, he says, God will never die as long as all the forms in which he is represented are repudiated. So you get a sort of sense of the complexity of this very negative theology. But... It, it, you know, in essence, Bunfa is committed to the notion that the world we're living in is the only world, that the earth we inhabit is our place. And it's an affirmation of this earthly place uh, that allows a kind of transcendent energy, which you might call a religious energy, to be fully invested in the here and now. Mm -hmm. And nothing outside it, if we flee it in hopes of a better world, some other world, a transcendent order, something somewhere else, we miss the great opportunity, which is to live fully in the present. Another, another thing we was briefly touched on is the importance of avoiding a conceptual relation to the world. We tend to replace things, people, with either images or a conceptual understanding that deprives us of this much more immediate uh, and, if you will, intimate, dramatic relation, which is the relation to realities that Bunfo calls the relation to presence. And in these relations with any, any, any specific thing that exists, uh, the relation to that thing as a presence somehow aligns that thing to everything else that exists. Um, and that, that comes out very strongly in an essay in our book, our prose book called um, French Poetry and the Principle of Identity, and in other essays as well. So there's a complexity, but there's at the same time a, an adherence to, in a way, always the same categories of thought, but applied to such a wide range of uh, subject matter that with each essay, one has a sort of deeper understanding of what he means by presence, finitude, uh, the here and the hic at nunc, the here and now. If you uh, come in, John, um, just to mention that I, I quote in my introduction, some of the, there's a late memoir called The Red Scarf, which is about Eve's childhood, which is very important for the prose essays about, and he has a vision of emptiness. He has a vision of terror, really. Um, and of deep solitude, I would call it. He, he sees in the village Toirac, where he, his grandparents lived, he sees a man, it's dusk, night is falling, and a man just framed in a window, and there's stars appearing, and the man is a, an ordinary villager uh, fiddling about with something. But he says he saw the human condition in its absolute solitude at that moment. And I read Bonfoy now his affirmative poetics, and he does affirm, but it's in relation to this, these early moments of um, 
they are present, but they're a negative presence, they're of emptiness. And yet, um, who, who could be more convivial or sociable or generous with his time off the page than Yves Bonfoy once you had the privilege of knowing him? Indeed. And uh, one other thing I'd, we haven't mentioned the essays on translation, what an important translator he is, and how, um, how, how he manages to be not mystical, he manages to sustain a meditation on transcendence without being um, what some of his detractors who don't read it properly see as kind of mystical, windy French abstraction. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's not what he it writes, it's not who he is or what he does. There is a kind of precision and uh, investigation, research, of, and research of transcendence. And, and, and it's the dialectic between, if not the agon, the dialectic between, the, between his life as a poet, his life as a, an essayist, and his life as a, trans, as a translator. It's a triangle of forces. We are in the presence of a very, very great prodigious writer. Mm. That sounds like a summing up, but it's not intended to be. <laughs> I don't know how long we've got. The time up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I just, uh, in Oxford recently, a great man called Bertrand Marshall, who edits Malarmé, came to talk to the seminar at Oxford. And, um, Bonfoy prefaced Malamé's correspondence, painstakingly edited by Marshall, Marshall, who also did the play ed edition. And, and Malamé kind of um, does an extraordinary hatchet job on Malamé uh, in the preface to this, this book. And I, and I went and I asked Marshall a question. He said, yes, Bonfoy wears two hats. There's the poet's hat, and then there was the academic hat. But why, why we love Bonfoy, I think, is that the poet, the poet always over, overrode the academic in the last analysis, and he wrote this passionate essay about Malamé, but not exactly um, what you would imagine as a preface to a book, because he basically says, I, I cannot live with Malamé, I have to have Rambo. <laughs> so it was a... There was that sort of, I suppose, to go with what Tony's saying, there was that sort of passionate engagement with the subject always. I mean, I think being with him, he was extraordinary. He could be very good company, but he was also high-minded. There was, a, you felt there was this debate. Uh, I think I once travelled from the Collège de France back to Montmartre, and he was imagining Baudelaire talking to Mallarmé. I think on the forty-six bus. It was for the 46 bus. The 46. That was just a monologue going on. I didn't get a word in. It was, it was very fascinating. A famous bus on which he did some of his drafts of his Shakespeare translations. You're right. When he wasn't right. talking to you. <laughs> this was only once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, was the, what was the list of questions? Hang on. Um, how did it feel putting this new selection together? Can, can, so maybe talk about the reader, Tony and John. The maybe reader? Can... Well, I mean, that was the earlier volume of the poems. You... Oh, sorry, you I make... thought you meant our, our one and only reader. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we <laughs> hope we're going to carcanet. That's for you to help us reach some, meet, reach some readers with, with both, both volumes, the, the poetry and poetic prose, and then now the critical essays. Which is like it's about seven or eight hundred pages. It's it's magnificent. It requires a, quite an effort on the part of the reader in the other sense. Mais ça vaut bien le détour. Ça vaut bien it's, le it's, détour. A, it's very uh, gratifying to all of us to think that Bonfoy's legacy, his his legacy, his poetic and and prose and in some ways these things are so intertwined, that he now leaves this to the English-speaking world for those who are not going to be able to encounter him in French. Uh, here we are having done the best we could uh, because 
translation uh, of anyone, but especially Eve, is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, he once said about translating that um, it's, it's not so much a question of either creating some sort of inventive uh, approximation in the manner of some American poets who, uh, who have really created new poems from the original or staying rigidly attached to the original. But he said, it's more than anything else when you translate, it's an experience of reliving uh, what gave birth to the original text. And that has been very rewarding for all of us who try, have tried to translate Bun Fuang. But I think, we're, I think all of us feel extremely happy to think that, uh, thanks to Carcanet, there, there are these two volumes, of the poems that Bun Fuang himself before his death had a large say in selecting, and now a rich selection of his prose essays. So as I said, you know, in some ways we can say to ourselves, uh, we've, We've tried our best to assure his, his, that his legacy, his literary um, life, his literary work now is established for the English-speaking world. Mm.